Hold on, just get rid of that box. Great. Well, hello, I'm Mike Naylor with another music interview for Secret Records, and I'm joined by Jill Sayward from the British jazz funk band Shack Attack. Can Hi you there. Hi, can you believe that their classic second album, Nightbirds, came out 40 years ago in 1982? And to celebrate this big anniversary, Nightbirds has been remastered and is available as a limited gold-coloured vinyl disc, and only a thousand copies have been produced, all numbered as well. <laughs> Jill, welcome. That's so, good to hear you and see you. Great. How, how do you feel about this anniversary? Well, it's quite shocking to think of 40 years. In fact, it's 42 years now because we lost two years, didn't we, with um, the dreaded C word, you know. So, um, but it's remarkable. I would never have thought 40 years ago we'd still be here doing this. It's amazing. Why did you not, I suppose you just kind of live in the moment and, you know, each new album comes along and you don't project then too far into the future? No, certainly not in those days. I mean, in the 80s, we were all going crazy, you know, having fun and producing music. And, and you just kind of gave it a 10 year window being realistic we never we never suspected it would last so long does it seem that long ago though now because time is a funny thing sometimes you 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 know you, you think oh no it just seems like yesterday yeah some sometimes when you go to a gig or you're doing something suddenly you, you, you it's a groundhog day you think wow where's all that time gone you know um but Generally, when, when we go back to some of the, the we, we sit talking after the gig, some of the memories, we go, wow, you know, it just seems 100 years ago, a lot of the things. But um, I think because we've been continually gigging, it doesn't seem as bad as, it's not like we've been away for 10 years, we've been on the road for the whole 40 years. So you don't really take it as being that long, long ago, you know. So the debut album came out, what, uh, radio... Sorry, the debut album came out, I think, the year before. Um, and then Nightbirds kind of built on that, really. Um, do you actually remember making it and recording yeah, it? Yeah, I remember what, you're talking about the first album, Driving Hard. That was kind of um, the uh, testing the water type of album. I remember doing some tracks on there and thinking, wow, this band, band really do have something. And I was employed as a session singer. You know, I worked with them all the time, but in that capacity thinking, wow, there's some good stuff going on here. And then when they went on to um, do some tracks for a new album, I knew that it was worth sticking with this band. You know, they, it was going to do something. You just knew. It just had a vibe about it. How did, um, you know, Shack Attack sort of find their sound? I suppose it was led, what, by, by Nigel Wright and also Bill Sharp on the keyboards, right? Yeah, def definitely Nigel had a lot to do with it, but I think they were... Um, they were out in the States quite a lot. Well, Nigel certainly was out in the States and, and had heard of this new type of Brit, uh, jazz funk type of thing and brought some of his ideas back. And of course, along with Bill, um, Bill's expertise, he, he and he's listening to a lot of that type of uh, stuff from, from the USA, um, knew how to, how to get the whole thing together. Bill had been a radio producer at the BBC, I think he produced That's right, yeah. Still on Radio One, hadn't he? So it was and he still has that. He still has that BBC voice. In fact, you know, you can hear it. You do your job, so be careful. <laughs> <laughs> but there was quite a lot of competition around. If you think of maybe like Candidate and High Tension, Phil Fear and Galaxy, and of course Shalimar and Odyssey, Sister Sledge, then Michael Jackson. And how aware were you of what they were doing? Well, definitely with the with the Brit funk thing, we were aware of the little circle around us. In fact, we still have contact with a lot of the guys that we used to do the gigs with. And we knew we knew that we were in that set, but we were always aware of the fact that we were regarded as a little bit um, not cool compared to the other bands like like the World and Loose Ends and that because we just had this aura about us about being um, lightweight and fluffy, and it it was awful at the time because we got condemned for it an awful lot. You know, being lightweight and uh, we we weren't we weren't the level forty two of the time, or, or we we were more. We weren't so hardcore as some of these um, urban style bands. But you had that uh, commercial sound and, and, and picked up fans through the singles, obviously. But also you did have, did you not, fans, if you like, who were into the underground jazz funk scene as well. So you did sort of bring yeah. the two audiences together, I think. Yeah, but it really wasn't cool to say you were a Shag Sack fan at that time. And, it, and some of the media made it quite apparent that it wasn't cool to like that type of thing but um but, you know it it didn't deter us because it we developed a sound and a flavor that nobody else had created at that time because there was, well absolutely so know. distinctive you instantly know that it's a yeah. shack don't you 
Ah, and obviously, that... sorry. There, there was a, a famous um, uh, DJ, well, I, he knows about this anyway, his name was Greg Edwards at the time, when he was playing a lot of the sounds that you're talking some of the bands you're talking about, um, said, you know, he he played Shack Attack reluctantly and one of the, he said, I can't stand any more of this tinkling piano. If I ever get to meet Bill Sharp, I'm going to break his fingers. You know, and this was live on air. And of course we did get to meet him and um, there, there was a quite a... <laughs> A lot of animosity uh, towards him and that. And then late, later in years, he met and he said, he got me all wrong. It wasn't supposed to come out like that, you know, but uh, there was that kind of vibe, you know, but it served us well because now today we still, um, the sound is still there and people say, oh, that's shut up. Yeah. So did uh, you sort of experiment a bit, you know, before you laid the tracks down for Nightbirds and uh, there was a bit of, uh, you know, experimentation and improvisation? No, the um, Probably not. No, it was. It just came, you know, because I remember we were in the studio with Nigel. I think we were in a residential studio and he said, uh, yeah, we, you know, we've got some good tracks here. You know, we were just messing around, getting stuff together. And he said, but uh, there's not there's not another single here. We need another something bigger than easier said than done. We need something. We're all going down the pub. Let's leave Bill to write something. And we literally all left the building, spent an hour and a half down the local pub and came back and Bill to come up with the idea of Nightbirds, just like that. Good. That was it. Yeah. E e easier said than done. Had made it as a as a hit single in 1981, and then Nightbirds, yes. as you said, there was Street Walking was the another single from this album. But um, yeah. tell us about some of your other favourite tracks. I mean, Rio Nights is pretty Latin American, hence the title, isn't it? Yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, that that was a good thing about the albums because you could be quite diverse. You know, it wasn't. You know, there were quite a lot of instrumentals, not so much in the vocal area, which was great, you know, because it was just, it just covered all aspects. Mm -hmm. And that was obviously um, a success, gave us that success in places like Japan, because there were no issues with language and it helped build the bridge out there, you know. As a singer, you didn't mind sort of not having maybe whole songs to... to performer mm. well at that time no you you played we were you know it was with a singer called jackie raw at the time and we, we played, played did our job and just did what was needed and it because the shack attack was formed on an instrumental basis we kind of felt we didn't feel put out but it would have been nice it would have been nice to do a few more numbers live but obviously um that came later you know Fly the Wind, another lovely track, A Bitch yeah. to the Boys, uh, Light of My Life and uh, Taking Off. How do you think Nightbirds, the album, then sounds now in, in 2022, Jill? 40 years on. Yeah, very, very distinctive. I mean, I, I don't think you could actually, you could recreate the album, but I don't think you'd ever get those sounds again. It's just indicative of the time. There's just something about the sounds or lack of sounds or the technology. Let's put it in a bag that you could never really recreate that. You know, I mean, live, it, it's still the same as when we played it in 82. It's still the same, same energy, but you could never recreate that. And it's so that's that's the success of it. You put it on and you're back there and you know it's Shack Attack 80s. You know. And it stayed in the UK album chart for 28 weeks. It uh, got you your first uh, gold disc, hence the 40th anniversary edition coming out on gold vinyl, I think. I mean, <laughs> staggeringly successful. Did you expect that when you made it i don't think we did no no not at all it was it was all very um i wouldn't say it was easy but it all came so quickly and it took us by surprise you know, i remember going out to some of the tours and uh, as i said before in japan and not realizing the extent of the fame and the sales and it was it was a whirlwind uh, that we all got caught up in you know suddenly but saying that, we, we were all um, people that have worked in the industry and sessions and bands for donkey's years. So you you kind of prepared. It just didn't come out of nowhere. You, know, you went flying high up, up your own whatever, you know. It yeah. was, um, yeah, we, um, we adapted very quickly and enjoyed it. Let's put it that way. And, it, and we were touring such a lot. There wasn't any time to think about anything else other than gigging. And, and you were the headline act, I guess, and, and you had big audiences, big crowds and big venues. Yeah, yeah they, were, they were concert venues, two and a half, three thousand, you know, seaters. It's fabulous. No? And Top of the Pops and other TV, again, yeah. not just in the UK, but in Europe. What was that all like for you? That, that was kind of weird because uh, Bill will mention that quite a lot on stage about, you know, the year of Top of the Pops. And, but I can remember, um, with, certainly with Nightbirds, um, 
and invitations um thinking you, you would kind of be upset if you didn't get it because it was so regular you know we were on it so many times and of course the thing would chart and they'd use some of the old footage as well but after a while you thought oh it's top of pops again blase oh okay yeah and no, i'll be there you know it was like you know <laughs> no now you realize the importance of that show you know and yeah uh, invitations was the third shakata album that yeah. came out same year as Nightbirds, and then yes. uh, 1983 out of this world, 1984 at Down on the Street, and then a live album from uh, Japan. So right. you were working full on. Um, how do you look back on those heady days? I mean, was it pretty tiring and exhausting? Completely, yes. I mean, but don't forget, we were 40 years younger then. So that's uh, you know, it seemed <laughs> nothing phased you. I mean, I remember the guys. You know, we'd land in Japan, and they say. Should we go to the club? You know, we just landed and they're off to the club partying all night and um, then going to the gig the next day without going to bed. I mean, you could, you could die now if we did that. But, but we, we were we were good party animals and we we lived the life because we really didn't think it would last that long. You know, so it was a question of just burning the candle both ends and in the middle. <laughs> and record companies, of course, then I think had perhaps a lot more power over their artists. Did they put pressure on you to come up with another successful album and, and, and they wanted more product more or less straight away? Yes, they were always they, they were always doing that, you know, so we, we were always conscious of um, preparing stuff. But I mean, we never really sat in, in our rooms and hotels and did tracks you know, for the album. It was all a question of all meeting together, going into residential studio and kicking them out and working stuff in residence, you know. So um, I'm sure Bill had quite a lot of ideas and Roger was penning a lot of the lyrics and, you know, in, in mind for the next album, but it wasn't something we did religiously. No, we're, we're known for our laziness. Oh, no. <laughs> we, they... No, we are, trust me. <laughs> Did they, did they, the record company sort of put pressure on you to have a, to, to, to be on stage, how to look and want an image and uh, no. how to dance? <laughs> well, no, 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 that was, that was a strange thing. There, there was a time in the early days where they decided that perhaps we need a bit more of an image, you know, because everybody had, um, you know, some sort of gimmick or something associated with the music. So they did try uh, with stylists to give us some sort of uh, visual direction. But I think we gave it one TV show and just went back to doing things our way, you know, because yeah. we're, we're just too, we were too old hand at it. You know? And it wasn't really image concentrated like the other bands. It was musically concentrated. It was a piano. And, you know, and when you ask people about Shack Attack, oh, yeah, it was the piano and the long girl. <laughs> that, <laughs> that was about, that was about the, you know, they can remember visually. That's yeah. what it was, you know, the piano player uh, smiled a lot. I, I ask in a sense because alongside your success, you know, you could say there was uh, Adam Ant, there was Duran Duran, yeah. there was and our ballet where and, and culture club maybe all of that was led by boy george and and, and their dressing was was pretty glamorous glamorous and different and uh, the jam yeah. and, and 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 so on so there was a whole lot of other stuff happening at the same time as well as the electronic explosion of omd and yeah. chinese and depeche mode Yes, and that, that was the thing, you see, that there were identifiable images, but then maybe we were well known for our lack of it, which was it's kind of a good thing because it's that's another reason it served us well all these years because there was never any huge image in the beginning, so you haven't got to, apart from big hair and stuff, you know, there's nothing you, you have to live up to, which has probably been the downfall of many of those bands, you know, to be honest with you. Looking at some of the festivals you've played abroad, I mean, you mentioned Japan, but have you been big as well in um, Thailand and the Philippines? Everywhere, yes, yes. Well, one particular year, we were talking about yesterday at the gig, uh, we um, we were out there for six weeks and uh, there was four weeks to Japan and the rest was places I kind of remember in Asia, you know, Borneo, uh, <laughs> obscure places where we, we they hadn't had a, a live band, an international band. That was a fabulous tour, but it was it was long. Yeah, mm. and and do they get up and dance a lot? Those audiences and yeah. really adore you and, and and you know get involved. I guess. Well, we were told before we went to Japan that the audience were very static and they weren't likely that they just stay in their seats and clap. Um, I think there was some sort of underlying law that they didn't want people to be unruly and disrespectful to the band. But we did manage to encourage them to stand up and party now. You know, and, and that was. Quite, quite rewarding. We didn't know what to expect out there, to be honest with you. But um, the it was just it was just a wonderful experience to see a, a crowd for the first time, and the safety curtain went up 
their first kick in Japan. It was three and a half thousand people just going crazy and you look at each other. And we, we've had that sort of effect quite a lot of places. We went to Korea as well, where, we, you know, the, uh, we went onto stage and in the darkness getting ready. And as we walked onto stage, it was horrendous screaming and bashing the floor. And we're looking behind us to see what happened. We realised <laughs> it was us, you know. So there have been a lot of gigs like that, that, that you know, we were, we were unaware of uh, the success at the time. You know, it was fabulous. We're talking to Jill Sayward from Shack Attack and uh, their 40th anniversary edition of the second album, the classic second album by the band Nightbirds, is available as a, a gold coloured vinyl disc to celebrate its 40th anniversary since its release. We'll, we'll come up to date in a moment, but um, you at that stage that uh, Nightbirds came out were, were still sort of not an officially a, a full time member of the band, were you? It took That's a few correct. months before that was all confirmed. Why was that? Well, Jackie and I, were, we used to work together as session singers quite a lot. So whilst in the beginning days, the early days of Shack Attack, we were actually doing quite a lot of sessions for different people. So uh, Shack Attack was the main um, money earner at the time. But when it started to tour, you know, we became hard, hardcore members-ish, but we were still, still paid on a session basis. And that went on for a few years when Jackie Jackie left to do stuff with Sheena Easton and several other big name bands. And then we had a couple of other girls come in and try out and that didn't work. And whoever came in seemed to create a problem. So we got to the stage where Bill had this idea for a song, I think it was Dark as the Night, and I just did my vocal on it. Didn't need any backing vocals and we just left it at that. We just left it because it was a lot less hassle. And then we employed two girl singers on the gigs to do the unison Easy said than done some night bursts to make it that shack attack sound, but it's a lot less hassle. It really was. You know. <laughs> well, going through the records, I've calculated that Shack Attack have released 37 studio albums and live album albums. 37, and then yeah. a whole bunch of uh, compilation albums. It's a phenomenal back catalogue, Jill. I know, I know. You can, um, I think you can get some information online about the amount of albums, and even I don't know how much it, it, it is because there's so so much released in in Asia under different licensing. It's just phenomenal. Sometimes we get to a gig out there, and we do some signing after the show, and you're sitting there, and you go, "Oh, that's nice. I haven't seen that before." <laughs> and uh, you know, that, that's that's how it is, which is great. You know, of course, Secret Records are, are really helping by putting these. Uh, the two albums on one, you know, they're, they're really behind um, still getting the old product out there. And that, of course, that creates the interest and the gigs and the whole thing rolls on, you know. Mm. So when you put a live gig together now, um, you know, there's so much material to be able to choose from. How, how do you plan that? Is it it's, different? It's a real, so, sorry, yeah, no, it's a real problem because um, we've got quite a lot of hardcore fans in the UK and they say, I wish, can you, can you play this? Can you this? body of work you've done wish you could do this wish you could do that but when you get to the gigs there's like two 45 sets or an hour and a half set and uh night birds easy said than done dark as the night down the street it takes up three quarters of the set nearly and if you don't do those numbers you you're penalized for that you know and um we try to scatter new stuff into it now and again but it's really difficult and people can uh, are disappointed on online sometimes. You'll you know, say, well, you didn't do this, didn't do that, all this fabulous work you've done, but what what can we do? I don't know how we do it, because I, I try and organise the sets, you know, and I look at it and think, how can we do this? We can't even do stuff from the last album because there's just no room, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, unless, unless we get the hits and put them into some sort of medley, but I, I think fans would be disappointed at, at that you know i've been to a few concerts where they rush the hits into one number and i think mm. yeah i get that i get that yeah. and as we speak you've done a handful of gigs in the uk sort of celebrating this particular anniversary um i suppose as you said 2020 was the official 40th anniversary since yes. the formation, but that all got pushed back because of the pandemic um and then you've got more uk gigs coming up in the uk in may june july august and, and a whole raft in September. Uh, what was it like returning to to the stage, you know, in 2022 after a layoff? The, well, the first gig we did was over in God, in Surrey somewhere, because it was a festival. It's kind of a weird, weird atmosphere. You, you, you didn't quite believe you were back on the stage. And it was none of us re could really get into it. The fact that we were actually gigging again, you know, because it had been so traumatic, particularly for me. I'm not sure personally how everybody else fared, but for me, it affected me so badly. Um, but 
I couldn't believe I was there. I didn't enjoy the, the first gig. And I think that the second gig came along and I thought, oh, this is so good. I'm back. I feel like I feel like I've got a reason to carry on now, you know. And then from from then on, the gigs have all been so fabulous, so well attended. And the audiences, you you feel their frustration and their happiness more than you do ours because you know you just walk on stage and it's like, yes, live music, live music. And and the adulation has been just lifts your spirit, you know. And you think, well, okay, let's just delete two years. Delete. Uh, yeah. yeah easiest thing to do did you have to practice hard and rehearse hard in advance of those you know because you'd had this layoff or given your experience and uh, the the sort of the the professionalism of the band it all kind of flowed quite naturally again yeah I, as i said to you earlier we were the laziest band in the <laughs> land and we didn't we didn't we don't rehearse at all and we went to the gig and just ran through a number in sound check and thought well, that's, that's okay and that was oh it. wow that's it <laughs> Do you have to look after your voice though, you know, by, you know, um, warming it and keeping it going privately before a gig or something? I did do some rehearsal because in my place in Italy, I've got like a nice music room with during it and kiss it. So I did do a little bit down there, but it can never compensate for a live gig when the nerves kick in and, you know, and you're dancing across the stage and that you can get breathless and that. But I did do a little, but not for the gig. You know, it just, it just, I mean, Roger kicks off the open number. Sometimes it's not having a, a, electric shocks it all clicks into place and everybody was like kicking kicking at but you know it's <laughs> no but it, it works so the essence of jack attack now is obviously yourself jill on vocals percussion and flute and then bill sharp on the keyboards uh, george anderson on the bass and roger odell on the drums but you have two or three other musicians that join you for the live set right that's right yeah we have um alan womald who has been with us he's a, he's a, um, a fair while 20 odd years and uh, Jackie Hicks plays sax, and that's been with us equally as long a longer time. And a lady called Debbie Bracknell. And yes, we do. You know, if they can't do the gig and that, we we're covered. You know, we've got our teams and that. But yeah, Alan and Jackie have been with us the longest. You know, it's it's um, we call, we call them the newcomers. But you know, I mean, there's 20, 25 years of service. <laughs> and to mark this anniversary, do you do you use any sort of videos and archive footage of the band or not? Uh, to sorry to. Do, do you have any sort of films or videos from the past that you sort of project on behind you on the stage? For no, a no, 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 no. We, we, the, the last gig we did uh, on in Wales the other night, they had a projected screen um, behind us. And it was most disconcerting. We were looking at each other. But we, we don't, there's no effects like that, no. It's just hardcore music. I mean, we have an, an intro tape that's grand, you know, but that's about it. There's no... Um, Mm -hmm. Unless some of the, some of the shows, some of the festivals, they provide some sort of um, you'll see some archive footage of the Japanese video or something. But no, it's generally it's just us. Yeah, you're doing some other summer festivals again this year, and you've done them in the past, and you've also been, I think, part of sort of eighties uh, uh, festivals, if you like, retro festivals as part of the Rewind group with lots of eighties artists. It, 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 do you get? Do you have to sort of um, put a different set together for playing in the open air or not? Yeah, um, as much as we love those gigs, because they're always well attended and that, um, people tend, as I say, because of the image problem, they, they don't really, re you know, that we don't fit in wonderfully to those to those gigs uh, because um, we're, we're, because we're specialists in our music. They, they tend to have, like the artists you were talking about, you know, uh, high media people. But the ones we've done with Level 42 and a couple of other bands from that era have been really good. But... The, the whole essence of a rewind and um, these tribute um, uh, revival gigs is a problem for us a, a little bit because we haven't been away to be revived. You know, we've been touring <laughs> the whole time. So it, it we're not new. We've been out there the whole time. So perhaps we're not as popular on those as we, as we need to be. You know, I mean, I, I enjoy them because it's a great time to catch up with all the people you met on top of the pops. They go, ah, oh, hi, hi, you know, we're all still doing it. We've done a couple of things like that in London and, and it's really nice. You know, but the festivals can be a bit um, disconcerting because you don't really see anyone. They're in their trailers and you just go on when you're sold, you know. You, you make it all sound so pretty effortless, really. <laughs> Isn't that a great attribute it to be able to... It kind of is. Yeah. yeah. It, it, yeah. The, the only thing that gets to us is uh, getting to the gig, you know, like driving to the thing and um, getting everything arranged on, you know, get the crew to do it and hanging around. The actual gig and the 
prepare, you know, the, it, it is the best bit. Mm. That, mm. That's the highlight. And, and uh, over the last few years, while Shaky Tack has been around and, and, and still playing live, um, uh, Bill Bill Sharp, he's had um, a couple of other side projects, solo projects, and he teamed up, of course, with um, a member of Mezzo Forte, an Icelandic mu musician. Yes. And uh, also jo uh, George, George Anderson had a, an album out, I think it was at the back end of 2020, I spoke to him about it, a really yeah. interesting uh, funk album, which he recorded entirely during lockdown, and he's based yeah. in Amsterdam, as you know. And then you've had uh, three solo albums out. The original, uh, Just For You, came out in... Uh, 1999 but don't yeah. remind in 2016 and then m is for manhattan and then endless summer and some singles um you have uh, a lot of writing for those albums do you did you yeah uh, it's something i always wanted to do i mean I, I, the the album just for you was a collaboration with george as well and jason rivella and um i have to say out of the, the solo work i've done it still stands proud for me that there's some some stunning tracks on that even though i say so myself but it was a, <clears throat> a special album for me and there was there was plenty of material at the time because i was doing a lot of writing with george obviously and at this particular moment i don't we've slowed down with that because we've been working so much you know so um i mean i should have taken the time in lockdown to do stuff but i was busy doing videos and keeping the, the shack attack um vibe live online you know because what else could we do you know we were doing odd videos and um redoing old stuff getting punters to decide what songs they wanted us to do and just recreating them and keeping the whole thing um energized you know but um so i didn't get around to anything new but i'd like to do something new or, or you know collaborate with somebody at the moment i feel i'm ready got enough material now to get started on something new. Yeah. You put a couple of singles out there, Women Like You in 2020 and then uh, 2021, I Want to Be With You. And also I noticed you covered a T-Rex single as well, didn't you, for a compilation album, I think, uh, Children of the Revolution. Yeah, that, that T-Rex, it was um, to do with our sound man, Nick Smith, who uh, uh, said to me, you know, you do a guest, guest spot on some of these albums. It was a, uh, a Sting tribute as well. So I did Roxanne and, and stuff. It was good what? fun because they're both all those tracks were heavy rock centered. So I had to go in and put Shack Attack on the back burner and be, ah, you know, uh, Joss Stone, I suppose, mm. <laughs> <laughs> for the day, you know. Sounds like life is good, good Joe. Yeah. So the, so, sorry, say again. Sounds like life is pretty good. Life is really good. As I, as I say, I'm here in my son's house over in, in Bury St Edmunds and um, enjoying being a nanny, so that worked quietly. Uh, <laughs> my life is good. Touring and we're starting to get some work together to on the next album. So that'll be our 150th or something. <laughs> and um, so I hook up with Bill, um, who lives very close to, to, to me here. And yeah, we'll get started on some new stuff. It's good. It always it, that always excites us, you know, to get some new new tracks out and start pushing yeah. them around. And do you still get favourable reviews? You know, they're not going back to those original ones you referenced earlier. I hope fluffy and all that. Yeah, well, those, those references earlier were on our sort of general appearance and our names. You know, we got we got accused of having boring names like Keith and Dave and stuff. You know, so oh dear. But no, but now no, it's it, it's specialist. You know, we our, our music is. We've become legends in a way in yeah. our own lifestyle because we've been around so long. So it's hard for anyone to knock us. How can you knock us? You know, we're still here. We're still doing the same same as we've done since 1980s. Still creating great music that people are enjoying today. So what's the knock? Yeah, you might not like a track, but 10 out of 10 for still being here and doing, believing in ourselves and still doing it. Well, may you continue for much longer and go on doing it and enjoying it. We've been speaking to Jill Saywood from Shack Attack and the 40th anniversary edition of their second album, Nightbirds, is out as a gold coloured vinyl disc. Only a thousand have been uh, pressed and they're all individually numbered. So you have to go to uh, secretrecordslimited.com to order secretrecordslimited.com or to the Shack Attack website, which is simply shackattack.com. That's right. Jill, I was playing these records sort of at the start of my career on the radio in 82, 83. And it's just amazing that my great. past caught up with you now in, in the present. And uh, they sound great to me and I still love playing.